welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. The title says The American Mind, but I think this is more broad across the whole world, uh, across the entire generation. These types of examples are being seen everywhere. And the idea that coddling uh, comes from overprotecting. So we think uh, if we wrap something up in cotton wool and protect it, then it's going to be safe and it's going to be better in the long run. But the authors are saying actually too much overprotection is actually bad. Mm, so in that subtitle, how good intention, so coddling being a good intention can actually have very bad outcomes. And coddling is just one thing that's happening and setting up a generation for failure. So the authors notice three great untruths that seem to have spread across the world. The untruth of fragility, that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. The untruth of emotional reasoning, that you should always trust your feelings. And the untruth of us versus them, that life is a battle between good people and evil people. Now, the authors here is saying that for something to be untrue, it has to meet a bit of criteria. First of all, it has to contradict ancient wisdom. It contradicts modern psychological research on well-being, and it harms the individuals and communities who embrace it. So those three great untruths that met those three criteria, uh, they're being seen in policies and in political movements all across the world, uh, where the ideas were to protect young people, but really we're seeing that if you embrace these three untruths, you're actually going to be much, much worse off in the long run. So things are clearly and objectively on the rise. Things like teen anxiety, depression and suicide rates, they've gone up through the roof in the last few years. Cultures on many college campuses, for example, they're very ideologically uh, uniform, which compromises the ability for scholars to go out there and seek truth and have interpretations from all angles. So in this episode, we're going to expand uh, and flesh out those three great untruths. We're going to give a few examples of some bad stuff that's been going on. Uh, we're going to work out how do we get to this point, and then hopefully, how can we fix it? In 2009, Max Height, Jonathan Height's son, is it Height or Height? I, I think it's Height. I don't know, mate. I don't know. Anyway, let's go, let's go with that. Anyway, his son uh, was headed for his first day of preschool in Charlottesville, but before he took that first step in, the parents had to attend a mandatory orientation session where obviously they laid out a few ground rules, they went through some of the procedures, and the teacher explained what uh, the kids were in for. Now, the most important rule, uh, judging by the amount of time that was spent drilling it into the parents, was no nuts. Also because of the risk to children with peanut allergies. And this was an absolute prohibition. So not just nuts, anything that just contained a little bit of nut, no legumes, peanuts, peanut butter. And to be safe, they actually banned anything produced in a factory <laughs> that was also processing nuts. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be pretty tough. So that means dried fruits and snacks prohibited too. I feel like almost everything you flick over the back of the pack and it says, you know, may contain traces of nuts. It'd mm. be hard to, hard to monitor. Anyway, so Jonathan was thinking, well, let me just ask, does it, he put his hand up or he stood up in front of the group and he said, look, does anyone here uh, have a kid who does have a nut allergy? Because he said, obviously, look, if, if a kid's got a nut allergy, we're going to do everything we can to avoid putting that child at risk. Uh, but of course, if no one had it, then what's the point of going through all these procedures if no one's at risk? But very quickly, the teacher jumped up and said, no, 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 no one answer that. You don't have to answer that. Don't be put on the spot. It's okay. Uh, this is the rules and this is what we're sticking to. We don't want anyone to be put under pressure or, or shamed for having a kid with a peanut allergy. In one sense, you can't blame the school for being cautious. Peanut allergies were rare among children up until the mid-1990s because one study found that four out of a thousand children under eight had an allergy in 1990, but by 2008, the number had, had tripled to 14 out of a thousand. Nobody knew why American children were suddenly more allergic to peanuts, but the logical and compassionate response is obvious. Kids are vulnerable. We need to protect them from peanuts and anything that might get in contact with them and hurt them in any way. Like, why not? Like, what is the harm of just protection? In the 1990s, they figured, look, there's four out of a thousand. It's a very tiny minority, but we may as well protect them. Um, what's the harm? Turns out the harm was actually very severe. One study called the, the LEAP study, the learning early about peanut allergy, they looked at 640 infants and the results were wild. So they had half of the group where they just went about their normal business. They were exposed to peanuts every now and then, uh, maybe through the, through the mother or through another kid who had a peanut butter sandwich or they were given peanuts themselves. Turns out only 3% developed a peanut allergy. But then among the people who were protected 
where they were uh, completely cut off from any exposure to, to peanuts or legumes or peanut butter of any kind, it turns out 17% developed an allergy. So it actually was by protecting them, it turned out to be much more harmful in the end. Yeah, multiplied the likelihood by a factor of five in that sense. And it does make perfect sense because it's the immune system, it's a miracle of evolutionary engineering. You can't anticipate every pathogen and parasite that a child will encounter. So it's designed to learn rapidly from early experience with the immune system. So it does learn when a peanut comes in and goes, all right, I'm going to develop ways to handle this. But if the peanut never enters, then the immune system is never going to learn. So our immune system requires exposure to a whole range of foods, bacteria, even parasites, a couple of worms, throw them in there every now and then, uh, and your body can learn to fight them off. The same sort of thing goes for vaccinations. If you get a little bit of a dose and your body learns to fight it off, your immune system is going to be a lot stronger in the end. So by exposing children to small doses of these things that could later become harmful, we're actually strengthening them. And by protecting them from all these little tiny things that could be bad, we're actually making them much weaker in the long run. So this is a specific example, but it can be brought into a, a bigger metaphor about how we're treating our kids because teaching them that failures, insults, or any kind of painful experience is going to do lasting damage is harmful in and of itself in a, as the subtitle says, uh, well-intentioned, but are actually setting them up for failure. Because humans, we do need physical and mental challenges and stresses or we're going to deteriorate. Too much rest, it's going to cause atrophy and joints loosen and the blood clots form. So we actually need these stresses. If you've been listening for a while to the podcast, you would have heard the, the episode we did, Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. He talks about this idea that some things in our world are fragile, things like the China teacup, you drop it on the ground, it breaks instantly, it can't heal itself, that's game over for the teacup. Some things are resilient, you can drop it, but it withstands shocks, it's not changed, it's not worse, it's not better, it just stays the same. But Taleb says that actually, well, there are some things that go beyond resilience and they actually become anti-fragile. So a little bit of stress actually makes them better. So of course, uh, our immune system is one of those things. A little bit of stress, throw a peanut in there, throw a little bit of chicken pox vaccine in there, and it turns out that actually our body gets stronger as a result of this little bit of stress. So there's this old saying, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. But today, we're just protecting our kids that much, you know, making them not even look at the road, just actually probably stay at home and uh, don't even take a glimpse at all. And, and because of that, the kids are going to be hopeless when they hit the years, when they need to be entering the world and, and traveling and dealing with the real stresses, they're going to hit them at some stage in life. So we talked about those stresses of peanuts, but there's also uh, that idea of stress has expanded uh, in the 20th century. Safety meant physical safety. You know, in the, in the sense of in the 80s, they introduced seatbelts and deaths from car accidents plummeted. So now in the 21st century, that idea of safety has now spread to emotional safety and the idea of safety and trauma has really expanded. So let's take this word trauma, for example. Very early days in the manual of psychiatry and psychiatrists, they used the word trauma very, very sparingly. It was only when there was a serious physical agent that caused some physical damage. For example, you smack your head up in a car accident, you've had a traumatic brain injury. In 1980s, it went through another revision, and this time it was for post-traumatic stress disorder. And this was pretty understandable because someone might overseas in a war, they'll have an extraordinary and terrifying experience. They might you know, kill someone at point-blank range, something that is so far out of the human experience, it lodges in your brain and you're never really the same again. Uh, things like war, rape and torture, they were all included in this conception. The painful occurrences that everyone goes through in their life, like divorce or the death of a loved one, they couldn't be in the classified as trauma. But then by the early 2000s, this concept uh, within the therapeutic community had crept and crept and crept and so it had expanded again. And the new definition then became any, anything experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So I think there's a lot of things that would fall into that category. Mm. Well, all of a sudden, it turns into something subjective. Mm. And I've been heard, I've been hearing the word trauma being bandied around a few times in, in, in a little while. I'm sure you have as well. Uh, a lot of time, they're pretty bad experiences, but they're nothing compared to what the old concept was. And right now, these experiences people have uh, maybe a few times a year, they're put in the same basket as the old versions of, of trauma, and we're expected to give them the same level of safety and protection when that word gets thrown out. 
So that's the great untruth of fragility. The, uh, the untruth is that the idea that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. So the good intentions are to try to protect everybody and everything from anything that's harmful, any kind of trauma, uh, increasing the safety, just to wrap everybody up in uh, cotton wool because everyone's so fragile, we don't want them to break. Imagine you're in a college, it's winter, you're feeling a bit down, feeling a bit anxious and a bit blue. You haven't been outside for a little while. It's been uh, snowing in the US. Unfortunately, we don't have that here. But uh, you attach no stigma to going and seeing a psychotherapist, of course. So you head to the counselor and say, look, I've been feeling a bit down. I'm feeling a bit anxious lately. And the, psych- and the therapist responds, wow, people tend to only feel anxious when they're in great danger. Do you really feel anxious sometimes? And you say, well, yeah, I've been, uh, been a little bit anxious. And he says, well... Generally, you know, if, if you experience some kind of trauma in your life, then you could be, you know, broken at the moment, but it also could really harm you for the rest of your life. So let's try to, uh, let's try to protect you from any kind of harm, any kind of danger that could come your way. So this is the second untruth of emotional reasoning, always trust your feelings. So in that case, this person's feeling anxious. So that anxiety is just a sign that the world out there is dangerous and we need to trust that feeling of anxiety. Yeah, pretty horrendous uh, therapist. Normally, the therapist should sort of say, oh, no, let's pump the brakes. Let's put this into perspective. Your feelings might not be 100% accurate. Let's have a look at the bigger picture. They're not meant to amplify the fears mm. like this one and just make it 10 times worse by saying, well, actually, you could be screwed up for the rest of your life now. Yeah. So I don't know if the therapist here is like a literal example, maybe. I think it was a made up. I think it was, it a, made up. It was, it was more a, of a representative. It was a com- comedic sketch version of a, <laughs> of a therapist. I'm pretty gullible, mate. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a representative of our culture right now with this, this, this trusting of your feelings. But this is really the opposite of a lot of the wise books that we've covered. It wasn't long ago we did uh, Epictetus where every big dog throughout history said the absolute opposite of this. Like Buddha said, our life is the creation of our mind. Epictetus himself, he said, what really frightens us is not the external events, but the way in which we think about them. So it's really putting the onus back on us and it's really our interpretation of our events what determine our reality as opposed to our anxiety being confirmation of the dangers of reality. Yeah, that's it. As, as the great Shakespeare said, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking that makes it so. Uh, we, when you see something uh, external, something objective that happens, uh, all these great philosophers throughout history are saying, well, you can choose to be harmed by that or you can choose to see it as just something that happened and not to be harmed. So, of course, if we always, if we always trust our feelings, if something feels a little uncomfortable and we think, oh, we've, we've been harmed, oh, we've, we've now suffered from trauma, uh, the, uh, the authors and all the great philosophers throughout time are saying, well, that's kind of a choice. And mm-hmm. if, you'd, if you'd rather choose not to, then you can choose that it wasn't a harmful thing, it was just something that happened. A prime example of how this is manifesting itself now is how some professors are encouraging mental habits that are similar to this cognitive distortion of old mate therapists before and it's through the promotion of the word microaggressions. So uh, B. Old Height, he called out this uh, professor here, which is a bit of a slap up, but Daryl Wing Sue, a professor at Columbia and according to him, microaggressions are defined as brief and commonplace verbal, behavioral or environmental indignities. And that definition also said that whether it was intentional or unintentional, these could be uh, taken as hostile, derogatory, uh, or negative in any way. So it's kind of like saying, look, someone says something and you can interpret that as a microaggression. Obviously, an aggression is someone who actively, intentionally goes out of their way in an angry and aggressive sort of a way to either say something hurtful or do something hurtful. But now they're saying, well, there's actually microaggressions Mm -hmm. as well. Just in the normal things that people say, if you sort of read between the lines, maybe they're actually saying something uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. They're sort of masking these aggressions below the surface. Yeah, the original essay had examples like a white person asking to teach words about an Asian's native language. And this could be interpreted as saying, oh, you're a foreigner. Mm. So in this case, the Asian person could be offended or a white person saying, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. And in this case, some interpret that as an implicit statement that people of color are given unfair advantages because of their race. Or another one, America is a melting pot. And this can be interpreted by some as an injunction to assimilate to the dominant culture. So these are all like... uh these are interpretations, I'd say, of those facts, uh, and it's sort of the way that you choose to look at it. You could see, you know, somebody saying, 
Uh, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. You could read between the lines there and say that that was a microaggression. That was somebody in a racist way saying that uh, people of color are getting unfair advantages or uh, you could choose to see it as, well, maybe they're just saying the most qualified person should get the job. Mm -hmm. So, there are multiple ways to interpret these and um, but the main point here, is this actual student better off embracing that feeling and being a victim and choosing the microaggression path and where this leads the student to in the future in terms of that concept of fragility and anti-fragility or are they better off asking to adopt a more charitable interpretation that might be warranted by the facts? So, there's sort of a shift from uh, in the past, it used to be all about intent but now it's all about impact. So in the past, we used to hold people morally responsible for the acts that they intentionally uh, committed. So if somebody intentionally said something wrong, then of course we hold them morally responsible. But now uh, we're saying that we should be held morally responsible based on the impact as somebody else defines it. So the intent is not necessary. If you said something with, uh, with good intentions, but it was interpreted by somebody else in a different way and they were impacted by it, then it's your fault is what, is what we're now being taught. If you teach intention doesn't matter and encourage students to go out there and find more and more offensive things and let that line of what's offensive just creep out into more and more domains, you're going to find more and more ways to foster us feelings of victimization, anger and hopelessness in the students. A student named Olivia with parents who emigrated from Mexico to California wrote an essay in a student publication about her feeling of marginalization and exclusion. She noticed Latinos were better represented in blue-collar staff like janitors and gardeners than administrative and professional staff. So she found this realization really painful. So she wrote that she felt like she had just been admitted to just to fulfill a racial quota at the university. And if there's a standard of the typical person on campus, she's not it. She was feeling pretty bad about it. The Dean of Students at CMC, Mary Spellman, she uh, had read that essay that the student wrote in the, in the student publication and she wrote a private email to Olivia two days later and she said, Olivia, thank you for writing and sharing this article. We have a lot to do as a college and community. Well, would you be willing to talk with me sometime about this issue? They are important to me and the staff and we are working on how we can better serve students, especially those who don't fit our mold. I'd love to talk to you more. Now, what do you think of that email? Was it, was it like kind? Was it open? Was it warm? Or was it cruel? And mm. was it attacking her in some way? I'd say it was pretty kind. I think she was saying we're open to, to hearing about other people's experiences and trying to do better. That's a pretty good interpretation you could say. But Olivia, she saw the word mold and saw that as a way of saying, being told that she just doesn't match within the university. So if it was a student... In this position, it was in the habit of questioning initial reactions, looking for evidence and giving people the benefit of the doubt. That student might get past this initial flash of emotion and just, just move on. But this definitely isn't what happened. Yeah, Olivia posted, uh, she took a screenshot of that email and posted it on her Facebook page with the comment, I guess I just don't fit this wonderful CMC mold. Feel free to share. And uh, it went viral. People were spreading it everywhere, saying CMC's racist. They only want a certain type of people that fit within their mold. Anybody outside of their mold, they don't care about. Uh, and it basically erupted in this massive protest. Uh, it, uh, two students went on a hunger strike, saying they wouldn't eat until Spellman was gone. The university did not fire Spellman, but Spellman herself resigned in the face of this wild, angry protest uh, that got spread all across the national news. A basic principle of moral psychology is that morality binds and blinds. So this is a real useful trick for a group gearing up for battle between tribes, whether it's us than them. You might just be blinded about their arguments and information that challenge your own team's narrative. And this is what happened in this circumstance of us versus them. They were blinded by their own morality, unable to see some facts about the situation. So this is the, the third great untruth that the authors speak about. They say that uh, it's a, all about us versus them, that the world is really a battle between good people and evil people. And they're putting everybody into groups, saying you're either good or you're evil. And this is where they sort of bring in identity politics, which is a bit of a contentious term these days. Uh, but basically, the simple definition is that it's about political mobilization organized around group characteristics such as race, gender, sexuality, being opposed to a party, ideology, 
I don't even know what that pecuniary interests, basically saying how much money you got. So identity politics could mean a whole bunch of cattle farmers getting together or a whole bunch of wine enthusiasts getting together or a whole bunch of libertarians getting together to promote their own interests. And of course, this extends to other types of groups. So, you know, the women getting together, African-Americans getting together, gay people getting together based on some kind of common identity to further their own interests. But the big difference is in how identity is mobilized. And it can be done in two different ways. So the first one, common humanity identity politics, this is probably best characterized by Martin Luther King, the big dog who was trying to fix a big gaping wound. Obviously, there was huge racism back in his day and and it was even codified into law in southern states and customs, habits, institutions across the country. And obviously, it wasn't enough to be patient and just wait for things to just change incrementally. So one of his quotes by memory I have a dream that one day people will be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And kept repeating this metaphor of family, referring to all people of all races and religions and brothers and sisters, all being part of this one group. And this is what common human identity politics is. We're all humans here together, so we should all be treated the same kind of way. Yeah, there's another uh, American activist, Paulie Murray. She used to say, whenever my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I draw a bigger circle to include them. And similar sorts of approaches have played out in in movements all over the world. Think about more recently, uh, in, I think, well, I guess most of the Western countries around the world legalized gay marriage. And the, the whole point of the, a lot of the arguments was saying that, hey, we're all in this together. We're all people. We should be allowed to be married as well. So that's one approach to identity politics is the common humanity identity politics saying, hey, we're all in this together. We're all humans. So we should be all on the same page. Now, a different approach to identity politics is common enemy identity politics. So uh, we, we have seen this common humanity all around the world, but of course there is this rise of this common enemy identity politics. And it's sort of a way of getting a group together by picking an enemy because uh, in, in war, an effective strategy is to pick an enemy, build up this enemy, and it really can strengthen your group both in terms of numbers and in, in terms of enthusiasm or, or anger, where if you've got a big enemy that you want to take down, your group can become very strong. There's an example here from a Latino student in December 2017. He says this is probably more on the extreme end of the spectrum, but does represent uh, some extents of this common enemy identity politics that's spreading into the corporate world and uh, the university campuses. But this student wrote, your DNA is an abomination. And it was quoted, when I think of all white people I've encountered, whether professors, peers, lovers, friends, police officers, there is perhaps only a dozen that are decent. And she argued, through a constant ideological struggle in which we aim to deconstruct whiteness and everything attached to it, we will win. White death will mean liberation for all. Until then, remember this, I hate you because you shouldn't exist. You are both the dominant apparatus of the planet and the void in which all other cultures, upon meeting, you die. Yeah, it's pretty, that's pretty intense, but pretty it's intense. A, that's, a good, that's a good way to rally a tribe to say, let's take down uh, all white people. Uh, this sort of idea of this group struggle for power, it sort of boils down to the, the old Marxist approach of the, the proletariat versus the capitalist. It was the working class versus those who own the means of production. So it was making an us versus them, making a group to say, let's go to war, let's go to battle to take down the other side. Now this common enemy identity politics uh, is expanding to all sorts of groups. So any power struggle between groups can be framed as a common enemy identity politics where it's us versus them, we're the oppressed, we're the good people, let's take down the evil people who are the oppressors. Yeah, so back in Marx's day, it was based on economic terms. These days, it's more on the intersectionality. So everyone's put on a spectrum, whether it be race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, ethnicity, nation, religion, uh, age. And these are all different categories that people have pinned up one another. And then you've got classes of oppressor and oppressed. And by mobilizing as groups, you can find enemies between groups in this, in, in this way. At Brown University in 2015, a group of students stewed the president's office and they presented a list of demands to her. And at one point, one of the the blokes who was in the room, uh, it was a white male, he said, hey, can we have a conversation about... And the kids yelled, no, 
and they snapped their fingers, they put their hand in this guy's face and they said, this is the problem. The whole time, all we've been doing is these heterosexual white males have dominated this space and told us what to do. And at this point, the, the bloke meekly points out, well, he says, well, actually, I'm, I'm gay, so do I get to speak? And the student said, well, 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 well you're, you're still a white male, so you're at the top, so you're still not allowed to speak. <laughs> I remember in year eight math class, um, <laughs> I had a friend there, his name was Robbo and yeah, someone, the teacher asked then, hey, uh, everyone turned to page 155 and, and he just yells out, no, and just didn't do it. And, and then no one opened up the books. It was awful to the teacher, oh, but gosh. she started bawling her eyes out. Oh, my God. But that was a very Robert different. sounds like a douchebag. He is a bit of a douchebag. <laughs> anyway, that's got nothing to do with this. <laughs> it's quite interesting because at university, week one, you're actually trained in this intersectional thinking and universities are putting in everyone in different groups as opposed to widening that circle as something we've been really aiming for as a species for a long time. And you think as we're getting to the end of finishing that project, then uh, you could say this might be a step backwards. Back in Salem, Massachusetts in 1962, two young girls began to suffer from fits and tremors. And then some of the elders around the community, they said, oh, this is, this is witchcraft. And then within a couple of months, uh, dozens of people claimed that they had been tormented by witches who were patrolling the area. I guess they were probably flying around on broomsticks uh, or something, whatever witches do. And they also said, well, actually, our animals have been uh, tormented by witches and some of our animals have become uh, bewitched as well. Uh, So legal action was taken against at least 114 people who were accused of witchcraft. 19 of these uh, were executed by hanging uh, and one was crushed by heavy stones. 1962. Man, I thought that was earlier. I thought that was like uh, I thought there was like some 1600 stuff, but that's scary that that is. Uh, no, that is, uh, <laughs> I think it's a typo. Oh, by is it? <laughs> I was going to say. Hey, let's say uh, Salem. I reckon 1692. I reckon you got 1692 makes much, makes more sense. No, mate, it is. What? Oh no, no, 1692. Yes, yeah, 16, 1692 <laughs> makes a lot more sense in 1962. Uh, okay, so <laughs> yeah, okay, so in the 1600s there was this massive witch hunt, and uh, which is uh, obviously that was the most extreme version of a witch hunt throughout history. But oh. there's been many other witch hunts since then, not not just witches, but other sorts of witch hunts. Can you imagine being the one? Like you know, you're not a witch, <laughs> right? Obviously, you know you're just, you can't young, you're just a young girl. And they say, and they say, we're going to crush you by stones. You must be thinking, come on, I'm not, I'm not bloody guilty. Wasn't that the one where they, they also, um, they, they, t- I don't know if this is a cartoon version, but basically they, they tie you to a rock, throw the rock in the water. You're down there. If you come out alive, it means you were a witch and you used your powers to get out. But if you drowned, it means you weren't a witch. <laughs> Either way, you're cooked. <laughs> Mate, humans can be pretty stupid sometimes. Happened also in the Chinese Cultural Revolution in 1966, so a bit closer to home. Uh, this is where big dog Mao Zedong, he was warning about the threat of the pro-capitalist enemies. So zealous college students, they were on Mao's uh, bandwagon. They responded by forming Red Guards to find and punish the enemies of the revolution. So universities, they were shut down across the country for several years. And anyone who had capitalist values or any kind of foreign influence, they were found and they were prosecuted and persecuted as well. And then the rest is history. Obviously, tens of millions died in this process. So what is a, is a witch hunt? Firstly, a witch hunt arises quickly. There's some kind of dramatic outburst, uh, something that's not really regular in, in social life, but the community suddenly finds itself uh, infested with these. There's some kind of element out there that poses a threat, whether it's that people were a witch or whether it was... Uh, these pro-capitalist enemies coming in to change their way of life. The second aspect is it's a crime against the collective. So it's got this us versus them sort of element in it. And the whole of a collective existence is believed to be at stake. So it might be in the nation, the people, the revolution, or the state. Thirdly, the charges are often trivial or fabricated. Uh, they seem to involve some kind of petty or insignificant behavioural acts like, like two young girls who are twitching, uh, but then, of course, we, we blow it up and it becomes all sorts of these false accusations. And the fourth is fear of defending the accused. So when the public accusation is made, so that poor girl who's been called a witch at this stage, any friends and bystanders, they might know the victim is innocent, but they're very afraid to say anything. Because if you come to their defense of the accused, it might mean that you're 
uh, going against this collective ritual everyone's having against this person. Mm. And you, you might even be thrown in the same basket <laughs> yeah, exactly. as, a, as a witch or something. If, you don't if, want that. if your friend's going down, is up on get about to be hanged for being a witch and you say, no, no, she's not a witch, mm. I said there's probably a good chance to say, well, that's exactly what a witch would say, so you're up here next. <laughs> so, then, <laughs> so, so then you'd be, uh, you'd be very fearful of speaking out against the group and defending this uh, accused witch. So now we're going to zoom into a modern day witch hunt. And we're talking here about Evergreen State College, which is just south of Seattle. And since the 1970s, they've done something called the Day of Absence, where the students of color, they spend a day off campus each year. And then everybody around the campus understands the important contributions that they've been making. But where this changed in a very big way was in 2017, when Trump got in. Obviously, a lot of students were a bit pissed off, particularly the progressive ones. And instead of it just being all the people of color staying at home to to show their absence, they asked that all white students and faculty to stay away from campus entirely. So Brett Weinstein here, and I've heard this story a few times on the Joe Rogan podcast and a few other places, but he thought this was wrong because according to him, there's a huge difference between people voluntarily making themselves absent from a shared space in order to highlight their underappreciated roles and encouraging another group to entirely just to go away and not be around. So according to him, one's right to speak or to be must never be based on skin color. So the, the actual day itself came and went really without much incident. But a month later, um, people must have been brewing about this. A group of uh, a group of students angrily marched into Weinstein's classroom. Um, they cornered him in the hallway and they, ber- they berated him. They said, "You're a piece of shit. Get the hell out." Uh, they claimed that uh, he was he was being racist. He'd sent this email around to everyone saying, "Well, look, I don't really agree with this." And a month later, they decided that actually, no, you're you're racist. You should apologize. Weinstein, I think he's a pretty strong character, hmm. and he said, "No, I don't apologize. I stand by everything I say." Look, I'm I'm I I uh, respect everything that all these different cultures are doing, and I think the the day of absence is a great idea to highlight their important contributions that are often uh, underappreciated. But flipping the script and doing it the other way and telling it a whole bunch of other people not to come is totally different, and he doesn't support it at all. So he was trying to tell them, "I'll listen to you, and you listen to me, and let's just uh, discuss this." But they responded, "We don't care what terms you want to speak on. We're not speaking on terms of white privilege." So the students, they kept blasting and the pressure kept on mounting and there was concerns for Weinstein's safety. So things were starting to look like they were going to get violent. So the police rocked up, but they were physically prevented from reaching him. So the protesters, they were preventing Weinstein from actually exiting the building. And he, being a bit scared himself, he messaged his wife saying, you know, they're not allowing me to leave, not sure what to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eventually... Thankfully, Weinstein get, did get out, thankfully for his own safety because uh, it sounds like things were pretty heated. Uh, but there was later a bit of a like a, a, a public um, discussion or public support of saying, look, look, is Weinstein in the right? What's, what should we be doing here? What's the right approach? What's the wrong approach? Where's the line? And this sort of this whole thing really blew up. He was getting national media coverage. He was on Tucker Carlson tonight. The story went public. It was all over the world. And of course, that just made things a hell of a lot worse. Uh, interestingly, there are a lot of uh, faculty members, a lot of Weinstein's colleagues who would message him, like send him a text or send him an email, say, hey, I'm really empathized for what you do. Uh, I, I agree with a lot of the things you said. Unfortunately, I just can't speak up on your behalf. I can't defend you because otherwise I'm going to get dragged down into the shit as well. So that's one of those classic signs of a witch hunt in that people um, fail or people fail to defend the accused. So whilst privately they were happy to say, yeah, look, this is a, I agree with what you're doing. I am really feel for what you're going through. Publicly they were saying, nah, that Weinstein is a real jerk. We shouldn't, be, uh, we shouldn't be backing him up here. So this story has elements of the three great untruths we've covered in this episode. Firstly, the untruth of fragility. There was one professor in all of this who supported the protesters and said in a really angry monologue, I'm too tired. This shit is going to kill me. So just, you know. Yeah, yeah. what what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. They're saying this is just, uh, they're expanding this one tiny thing and Mm. saying, look, I'm screwed up forever. This could potentially kill me. The second great untruth is emotional reasoning. So in this old debacle, you got a student here just trusting her feelings and she used her own evidence as anxiety that something was wrong at Evergreen and she was saying, oh, I want to cry. I can't tell you how fast my heart is beating. I'm shaking in my boots. 
And thirdly, of course, the entire episode is a big illustration of the untruth of us versus them, that life is a battleground between good and evil people. And the students who were processing, they were interpreting that the progressive leadership and faculty, they were all exemplars of, of white supremacy. So far, we've spoken about those three great untruths, and we've spoken about a couple of stories and examples of of what happens when these great untruths get drilled into university students and how it extrapolates to these wild witch hunts. Now, let's have a look at how did we get here. So, first of all, is the polarization cycle, which we covered in the three languages of politics in a pretty interesting way, so I recommend listening to that episode. But particularly in the universities, viewpoint diversity is absolutely essential to any scholar. Because every professor, every human being is a flawed thinker and we've all got this strong preference for believing in what our existing ideas are and just assuming that they're right. So, we're all suffering confirmation bias. And one of the brilliant features of universities when they're working properly is that you've got communities of people who are disconfirming others' confirmation biases because you've got this diversity of different perspectives and you're going to hear where your reasoning is wrong in some areas. Because sometimes the left-leaning view might be correct and sometimes the right-leaning view might be correct. So, uh, big old hate man, he has done a bunch of studies to find out where different professors lie along the political spectrum. And generally, they found that throughout history and throughout most of the 20th century, there was a pretty consistent ratio of about 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 in terms of left versus right. So, there was always a slight majority of left-leaning professors to right-leaning professors, but it wasn't overwhelming by any means. So, it was like a nice balanced perspective of both sides. But by 2011, they found that the ratio of left to right had become 5 to 1. Uh, and in fact, but more recently, in 2016, he found that in psychology departments, it was now 17 to 1, and across all humanities across the board, it was 10 to 1 of left to right. So, the loss of political diversity is negative for the universities and students also. In physics, big old Newton, he said that every action produces an equal and opposite reaction, but in terms of politics, we often find that every action produces a disproportionately large reaction from the other side. So, uh, Lukianov and Haidt, they talk about the the polarization cycle, which starts out as one person saying one thing. So, let's say that a left-wing professor says something slightly provocative. Uh, then it leads to some kind of reaction. The right-wing media, they pick it up, they retell the story in, through their own language, they amplify, they lead to outrage, they take something out of context, add a bit of salt and pepper. Then once the right goes wild, then the left goes even more extremely wild the other way. They spread it all on social media, they tag people, they they share it, they uh, they start telling people they should be stepping down or they should be quit or they should be hung. Okay, maybe hung's, hung's a, bit, <laughs> a bit extreme, but basically it goes, this back and forth just gets more and more and more extreme on either end from this one one small, slightly provocative thing gets amplified and amplified. And of course, throughout this whole cycle, anyone who hears any parts of this story, they can find evidence to confirm their worst beliefs about the other side. And so we've been talking a lot about the left here, but because of this polarization cycle, a lot of extreme right wing has been evident as well. For example, uh, at universities, there were genuine racists who went onto campus and had posters that went up saying things like black lives don't matter and join your local Nazis. Mm. One progressive professor at one stage was copying threats like, I'll come to your house and kill you dumb black bitch. So obviously extremely awful things, but as people are getting more polarized, more awful things are manifesting into the world. Yeah, so obviously that's one one massive cause that led us towards those three great untruths. Another big cause is the rise of anxiety and depression. Uh, and if anyone saw, uh, what was it called? The Social Dilemma? Mm. The hate man was, uh, was, was pretty heavily featured on that actually. Um, and he was saying that really this, this new generation, this iGen, the group of people who have grown up with full access to the internet and to social media, they found that this wide adoption of things like Facebook and Instagram uh, has actually led to a massive rise in things like teen depression and even teen suicide rates. And aligns perfectly with the release of Facebook and the iPhone because these rises occurred for those born in 1995 and afterwards and they've been characterized as iGen because in 2006, that's when Facebook changes membership to allow 11-year-olds to jump on and this is where all hell started breaking loose 
because the goal of Facebook and big tech was how do we consume the time and conscious attention as much as possible? And of course, the way to do it is to tap into the social validation that all humans crave and all of a sudden you've got kids spending a few hours a day just hunting for likes and just seeing how many likes other people don't have and just wondering what the hell is wrong with me. Yeah, and they see the the images of the perfect person. Um, they're enhanced in some way, whether they're surgically enhanced or whether they're artificially enhanced through filters uh, and different apps where you can clean up your own appearance. They look at this person, they see this picture, they think it's real life and they think, well, how come I don't look like that? And it just goes this uh, this ongoing spiral downwards uh, and, and we've seen massive increases in all the bad things that are associated with that. So third factor that's really parachuted us to this point is paranoid parenting and this is through actual versus imagined risk so the old peanut story said at the start so we're all obsessed with the stories of you know kids getting picked up in a truck and taken away and everything like that but pretty much every objective fact is showing that the streets are safer than ever and the obsession with safetyism really doesn't do any good and it only leading to the harm that we've already spoken about yeah it ties into the decline of play as well that you don't see kids running around on the streets as much anymore or playing in parks because we think that that van's going to pull up and abduct them or we think they're going to fall over and break their arm or something. So so parents are trying to protect them and it leads to this decrease in play which has a whole bunch of uh, negative psychological impacts down the road. So yeah, before reading this, man, I thought play was something trivial but it turns out it's one of the most important factors of developing the brain because when you're playing around, particularly rough and tumble play, you're getting falls, scrapes, conflicts, insults, you're forming alliances, you're having betrayals, you're having these status competitions with every, all the little baby kids and everything like that. It's a lot of fun actually looking at kids when they're playing and just seeing these dynamics play out because really they are getting all these lessons that are fundamental about how they're going to live themselves in the world. But parents, by not letting kids play in the playground and hurt themselves and do these kind of things or lose competitions, they're setting them up for failure. Yeah, nearly all animals, uh, nearly all mammals play. There was a study they did on the classic case study of the, the old lab rats and they had three different groups of lab rats. One was just put totally alone in its cage. One was left alone except for an hour a day of normal play with a young rat. So that's where they were doing their tumbling around and bumping into each other and stuff. And then one was popped in a cage uh, for the hour a day that it got to spend with the young rat. The other rat was actually drugged so that it didn't want to play. So it was just a dull, lifeless rat just sitting there. Turns out that the groups one and three, if they were totally alone or if they didn't get to play, basically they became very, very fearful. And it was the group that uh, was allowed to have this rough and tumble play. They showed uh, fewer signs of fearfulness and they also engaged in more exploration of their new environment. So when they plopped them outside to say walk around or go check out this maze, the ones who had had that rough and tumble, bit of fight, bit of play, they were actually open to new experiences. They were checking out the whole world, whereas the other ones were just fearful. They wanted to just sort of stay in their own corner, um, which is obviously a very bad thing. And I think we can extrapolate that from lab rats to humans. You need that little bit of play. You need that little bit of fun. So as we wrap it up, something is going badly wrong for kids and teenagers around the world. And this has been shown up in things like the statistics in depression, anxiety, and suicide. So this new culture of safetyism and protectiveness is bad for students, bad for universities. And what can we do to change course? If you remember from the start, we talked about uh, a great untruth. If something is untrue, it meets those three criteria that it contradicts ancient wisdom, it contradicts modern psychological research, and it also harms any individual or community who embraces it. So remember, we had those three great untruths. The, the authors here give a bit of the antidote to those great untruths. So the first great untruth, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. The psychological principle is that actually they found that young people are anti-fragile. So a little bit of stress actually makes people better. And the ancient wisdom we need to remember, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. The second great untruth was always trust your feelings. And the psychological principle here is we're all prone to emotional reasoning and the confirmation biases, just a part of being human. But the wisdom to take here is your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. But once you master your thoughts, no one can help you as much. And the third great untruth is that life is a battle between good people and evil people. 
The psychological principle says that we're actually all prone to dichotomous thinking and we're all prone to tribalism. And the ancient wisdom from the great uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he says, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. So it's not that there's good people and evil people, it's that everybody has a little bit of good and a little bit of evil. Every episode, we do our best to go to Steel Man, the book, put the best possible version that we can to everyone because every book we choose, we know there'll be some people out there who it absolutely resonates with and it's the perfect book for them. But sometimes in the Steel Man, one of us will actually not really enjoy the book and actually give it like a one or two out of 10, whereas the other person might get it an eight out of 10. But if you want to be in on what we give every book we do out of 10, then sign up to our email list. Every month, we'll give you a review and our ratings out of 10 and plus a little summary of what we've done that month. Go to whatyouwillearn.com slash email.